প্রিয় দর্শক আপনাদের সবাইকে শুভেচ্ছা জানিয়ে শুরু করছে আজকের অনুষ্ঠান আজকের অনুষ্ঠানে আমাদের আরেকজন বিশেষ অতিথি ডক্টর খালিদ কৌজার ডক্টর খালিদ কৌজার ইজ এক্সিকিউটিভ ডিরেক্টর অফ দ্য গ্লোবাল কমিউনিটি এনগেজমেন্ট অ্যান্ড রেজিলিয়েন্স ফান্ড এই সংগঠনটি সুইজারল্যান্ডের জেনেভা ভিত্তিক একটা সংগঠন সেই সংগঠনটি কাজ করে অনেক বিষয় নিয়ে আমরা সেগুলো বিষয় নিয়ে শুনব এবং তিনি বাংলাদেশে অতিথি হিসেবে এসেছিলেন না বাংলাদেশ ইন্টারন্যাশনাল স্ট্র্যাটেজিক স্ট্র্যাটেজি একটি অনুষ্ঠানে বক্তব্য রেখেছেন এবং বাংলাদেশে গ্লোবাল টেরোরিজমের প্রেক্ষাপটে বাংলাদেশে যে স্থানীয় সন্ত্রাস স্থানীয় যে বিষয়গুলি আছে সেইগুলি নিরসনে স্থানীয় জনগণের উদ্যোগ কিভাবে করা যায় সেই বিষয় নিয়ে তা কাজ করে ডক্টর কৌজা ওয়েলকাম টু আওয়ার শো থ্যাংক ইউ ইটস এ রিয়েলি অনার ফর মি টু ইনভাইট ইউ অ্যান্ড টু টক ইউ ফর আওয়ার অডিয়েন্স ক্যান ইউ টেল এস সামথিং অ্যাবাউট ইউর অর্গানাইজেশন বিকজ দিস দিস নেম ইজ ভেরি মাচ নিউ ব্র্যান্ড ইন বাংলাদেশ Thank you. Thank you for inviting me firstly. It's a new brand in Bangladesh and I think a new brand globally as well. We're a very new initiative. Uh, we started just last September in Geneva. Mm -hmm. So this is really our first year of activities. The fund, the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, it's rather a large name, is the brainchild of something called the Global Counterterrorism Forum. And Bangladesh, of course, is a member of the Global Counterterrorism Forum. The purpose of the fund is to try to fill a funding gap Um, essentially, we believe that the international community has struggled to find answers and solutions to violent extremism, to terrorism. Yeah. We believe that perhaps in communities there may be answers, but communities don't have the money or the resources or the skills to realise their potential and to find those answers. This is intended as a funding mechanism to provide small grants to local communities to help them develop resilience against violent extremism. And Bangladesh is one of the countries that we're starting to work in. How many countries practically are? Because it's a very new organization and you are uh, uh, sure that it's not a uh, big organization yet. You're right, it's not a big organization yet. We have about $25 million already committed in, in three or four months. So we're moving, I think, quite quickly. We're starting in four pilot countries and those are Bangladesh, Mali, Nigeria and Morocco. And as we continue to work and as we expand our operations, we'll bring in other countries uh, as well. And I'm delighted that Bangladesh is the very first country that I'm visiting, and I see it really as the, the key pilot countries we take forward this work. Uh, thank you very much. Certainly we'll go for details on that. But before that, can you tell us something about the Global Counterterrorism uh, Forum? I can. It was, a, I, I believe, an initiative of the Obama administration during President Obama's first uh, period in, in office. It's a multi-state forum that includes Bangladesh and 30 other states. Mm -hmm. And I think this forum really came together in recognition that the so-called global war on terror, the current response to terrorism and extremism, frankly, wasn't working. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a great deal of attention and money and resources at the military, the police, the security, the intelligence end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And perhaps not enough at the other end. And the other end is about prevention, it's about working with communities, it's about trying to provide alternatives so that people make the right decision and not the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. Instead of dealing with people once they've become extremist, why not deal with them before they become extremists? Give them an education, empower their mothers and their families, mm -hmm. give them creative alternatives, create employment and so on and so forth. So I think that the, the GCTF was established really in recognition that what is needed is a more comprehensive approach. A military approach alone can't work. Of course, it's an important part of the picture, but alone it can't work. So let's make it a more comprehensive approach that also includes development, community work at that end. And that's the end that my fund is, is based at. Uh, that's good. Uh, and that practically started the new uh, uh, section of the discussion. Uh, why you choose Bangladesh as the pilot country? Well, actually, it's a very good question. And the answer is that Bangladesh chose itself. Um, we had three steering group meetings that led to the creation of the Global Community and Engagement Resilience Fund. And during those steering group meetings, Bangladesh and three other countries volunteered to be pilot countries. Uh, I think that's very important. This is a, a public-private partnership. It's not a UN agency. It's not a government agency. We are an independent institution. And it's clear to me that we can only be successful if we work with the government. And Bangladesh is a government that has volunteered to work with us. I've spent the last three days here in Dhaka meeting senior members of your government, uh, mm -hmm. consulting various people in various meetings, and I've been very pleased and gratified by the level of government commitment to this. So Bangladesh volunteered. It was not in any way imposed upon Bangladesh. That's good. 
Uh, uh, when the question of the terrorism, counter-terrorism, uh, that is, you practically described a wide range of uh, world scenario that uh, uh, fight against terrorism, war against terrorism, that has been a big prospect. Uh, we, can, we can discuss the big, big, bigger picture. But when we bring the uh, scenario in Bangladesh, and you are very much right that uh, why the terrorists in local level develop, what is their background, and uh, why they are now to become terrorists, why not before? That's the basic questions, and uh, your pious wish is the same wish to us, that if we could provide them education and other things, they could be changed. Uh, so in Bangladesh, you see that there are two types of uh, terrorism activities we can see. The, if you just look at one, is the link to the regional thing. It could be linked to the Afghanistan or mm -hmm. some parts of Pakistan or the India. Uh, that's quite big. But sometimes it originated from local uh, country and not because of the terrorized society, because of the some idealistic uh, views. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's linked with the uh, religion, sometimes it links with the uh, revolutionary communist, communistic mm -hmm. ideology. And we have both experience in the Bangladesh. Uh, did you have uh, a study on that, Bangladesh, where the Bangladesh stands vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, this sort of scenario? Well, firstly, thank you for those insights. I'm not an expert on Bangladesh, and indeed the fund is not intended to be an expert on any particular country. What we are here to do, and what I've spent this week doing, is, is setting up a nationally owned mechanism which will provide the fund the expertise and the knowledge that is required. We can't pretend that we can understand the drivers of extremism in countries like Bangladesh or Nigeria or Mali. They vary across countries. I think they even vary within countries, as you've suggested. So we are trying to harness local expertise, local strategies, local knowledge to guide us as to what is the best way to use the money in Bangladesh. So this is very much a, a nationally owned process. I, I had a, a, a large meeting today trying to begin to set up a mechanism that will include government, but also civil society and the private sector, so that that group of people can advise us what the challenges really are. I think the bigger question is, I don't think anybody really understands what drives people to radicalization. I think the think tanks and the governments in the international community have some ideas, but I think if we take the time to go to communities, to speak to mothers, to speak to religious leaders, to speak to teachers, and to say to them, what do you think the problem is? I think they may have quite different answers. I think we are, for a long time, we've assumed that we know the answers, and perhaps we don't. Speak to the communities, find out what their problems are, find out what their solutions might be, and then support them to deliver those solutions. I think it's a, it's a small part, but an important part of a response to this issue. But that's good to start with the society. And for long decades, uh, we are practically thinking, uh, as you mentioned, this way. Uh, but now the situation is bit practically a uh, bit more complex. Mm -hmm. Complex in two ways. One way, the political polarization inside the country, and so many uh, s different faced terrorist activities around the world. Yep. Yep. Uh, sometimes it's linked with the religiously. Uh, initially, we thought it is the Taliban. Uh, now we, think, uh, now we uh, just knew the name of IS. And, uh, in, in between, if you just look at the scenario of Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, you will find hundred names in the, in the name of the religious group, in the names of uh, Islam, in the names of other things. Uh, so, the, uh, so, how you practically differentiate or localize uh, these, these uh, terrorist activities and uh, can find a solution with just include the local community. I think that's a, that's a great point and you put your finger on one of the real challenges that I am facing as we develop this fund and that is translating domestic concerns into an international perspective right. and I think you're quite right we shouldn't pretend that what happens in Bangladesh doesn't have an influence in the UK we shouldn't pretend that what happens in Mali doesn't have an influence in France and I think it's important for us to recognize that of course we have domestic concerns, of course there may be things taking place today in Bangladesh, but there's a wider context. There's a regional geopolitical context, as you've mentioned. There's what's taking place in Syria and Afghanistan. And these larger contexts are very important indeed. Now, GSURF, this fund, isn't engaging with those larger political pictures. It recognizes that there is a larger political setting for the work that it does. But I would still insist that without this local 
community level development engagement, we can't succeed in trying to deal with this challenge. It's not alone the answer, but I think it's certainly part of the answer. And, and seeing how it fits into that larger picture, I think, is very important. Now, that, that, that's good. Uh, but I do have my full agreement with that. If you could involve the as community effectively, that could bring very good result. Uh, but in a country like Bangladesh or a country like Pakistan, where the over -pol political polarization in the society, yeah. political parties, civil society, business organization, women organization, everything is divided. And uh, somehow or rather these uh, small local domestic groups involved with either this group or that yes. group. So that will practically a very complex situation. If government tomorrow started uh, to develop some work, uh, the opposition who do not like uh, mm -hmm. this part in power, they will say, oh, this, this is, uh, they just uh, practically make half good uh, safe haven for their own uh, supporting terrorist group, or they are targeting our people right. just <coughs> to uh, uh, brand them as their enemy. Yep. So I, I don't know whether you could uh, just understand the complexity in the domestic level. Absolutely, and these complexities are played out in different ways in different countries. I'm in Bangladesh this week, I'll be in Nigeria in a few weeks, right. and the local complexities are very difficult. I mean, a couple of reflections. You speak about the polarization, and of course you know Bangladesh better than I do, but I have to say, during my short visit here, I've been quite struck by the constructive level of engagement between government and civil society in the private sector. I see a greater polarization in other countries. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I think one of the reasons that we should be starting our work in Bangladesh is firstly because this is an acute and not a chronic challenge. I think it's sporadic, it's, it's short-lived, I think it's incidental. This is not yet a country that you could describe as an extremist state by any means. There are, there's a danger, there is some radicalization, but it's still at the beginning of the cycle. That means it's an important country mm -hmm. to work in. I think it's a country where the government is taking this issue seriously. You have a whole series of strategies around various aspects of countering terrorism and, and countering violent extremism. I think from what I've seen, civil society is engaged and there seems to be something of a constructive dialogue between the government and civil society around this issue and I think that's very promising indeed. You're quite right in some areas and in some countries there's a real polarisation. Now you're, you're right to point out a political challenge which is of course we will always work with the government and we make that clear to the Bangladeshi government. We are here to work with and support the government and of course there are domestic politics. If we work with the government perhaps an opposition party wouldn't support us and so on and so forth. One of the ways we've tried to overcome that is to try to make this a multi-stakeholder process. So, for example, at the governing board level, the very top governance level of the fund, this is a multi-stakeholder board. We have uh, the private sector, we have civil society, we have research, we have foundations, we have countries that are giving money, we have countries where we're spending money. It's an equal democratic voting right around the table with different stakeholders. In the countries, in Bangladesh, I was spending today doing this, we are setting up local mechanisms which include the government, but also civil society, private sector, NGOs, to make sure that the government has a voice, but not the only voice. I think the importance of having independence is very important. The other way that we are trying to deal with this challenge is that in addition to listening to and working with the national government, we have established an independent review panel of experts. Those experts will give the board advice on which projects to provide funding to. So we have a mechanism in place and an architecture in place that guards against this becoming too political. We want to work with the government, we want to support the government, but we also, for our credibility, must make sure that we have independence. And I think the governments understand that. that, that that's a good idea. Uh, now, can we come just to some theoretical question? Because you do have that expertise, you do work with some international organizations. And I understand from your uh, uh, activity that you are very much involved with the World Economic Forum in Davos. Mm -hmm. And very recently, there are several uh, World Economic Forum conferences. This question raised mm -hmm. how the economic growth of a country obstructed by the terrorism activities. Yeah. If you put Bangladesh in that scale, or the region in that scale, uh, particularly where we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would quote back to you your own Prime Minister, who I think speaking in 2011 said that, correctly, Bangladesh has made great progress in terms of development. Many of the Millennium Development Goals have been achieved here in Bangladesh. She said that there were two great risks to progress in Bangladesh. One, of course, is climate change, and the other is radicalization and terrorism. So even in your Prime Minister's mind, radicalization and terrorism pose a threat 
to development here in Bangladesh. Now, on a global scale, I would say that Bangladesh is nowhere near as serious as somewhere perhaps like Mali or Nigeria. I think this is a nascent threat. I think it's a serious threat. I think we have to take it seriously. But I don't believe yet that it is seriously disrupting the economy or society here in Bangladesh. And that's the reason that I'd like to work here. Because I believe by working here, we can work on prevention, we can have some success, and we can help Bangladesh to continue down this road of what's been quite successful development. But you mentioned Davos, and I was in Davos last week with the World Economic Forum. What the most important message I got from Davos was that the private sector is very interested in this. Mm -hmm. The private sector is interested because extremism leads to poverty. Extremism distracts talented people. Extremism disrupts supply chains. Extremism destroys local economies. Extremism means that your investments are not safe. For really business-minded reasons, the private sector is interested in getting this right as well. So I think we have a coalition. Governments clearly want to deal with this issue, and rightly so. It can disrupt political, social, economic processes. The private sector clearly is interested. Civil society wants to play a role through education, women's empowerment, greater equality, greater voting rights, and so on and so forth. And I think if we can bring together those interests into a, into a coordinated, focused fashion, then together we can really make a difference. You already mentioned, but still I would like to know a more theoretical part, uh, as you have been expertised in this field in several parts of the world. Uh, what practically compel a certain group of a society or a country to this darker part of the life? Can, can you just, yeah, I am sure that this, this, this will not be the same, uh, what will, is in Bangladesh, will not the same in mm -hmm. uh, Nigeria or mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Mali, Mali or Morocco. But uh, there must be some uh, similarities, a certain group of the society uh, in the name of the religion or the other things or mm -hmm. the financial regions. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And, uh, uh, can you just from your experience tell us uh, the, how, how it happened practically? Thank you. And, and of Again, I'm not an expert on Bangladesh specifically, but I think you, through your question, have, have highlighted a real gap in understanding. I think, honestly, we don't understand what causes sometimes intelligent people, sometimes educated people, to take crazy decisions like going to Syria uh, and engaging in atrocities against innocent civilians. I mean, this is a, a fairly radical response to, to, to some issue that is dealing with, people are dealing with. Now, there's a whole range of possible solutions. For some people, poverty is important. Right. Perhaps poverty drives people into this. But then again, you have university students who are radicalized. Right. So poverty alone is not an answer. For many people, marginalization is part of the process. You might feel marginalized because you are part of a religious minority, mm. or because you are part of an ethnic minority, or because you are part of a political minority. So marginalization might be something to do with it. Disenfranchisement, not having the right to vote, not having the right to influence decisions, feeling that you are being left out of a political process appears to drive some people towards this as well. Very frankly, for very extreme people, probably individual circumstances, uh, the absence of a father uh, may be uh, an issue. Certainly, and extremism is more than religion, but certainly in some uh, scenarios, there is religious leaders misleading people. We have radicalized clergy, radicalized imams who are frankly preaching, I think, falsities and falsehoods to people. So a whole range of reasons from poverty to marginalization to disenfranchisement to religious leaders to the lack of a father to uh, women not being empowered to control their children. I mean, there's a whole range of reasons. And again, the whole point of this fund, the, the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, is to try to speak to communities to find out the answers. Because honestly, I don't think we know. Okay, uh, we'll just take a short break uh, after a short translation in Bangla and then we'll come back again to Bangladesh issues. Thank you. Dr. Khalid Kostler has said that in this country, Bangladesh is a state of the country, which is a state of the country, which is a state of the country, which is a state of the country. So, this is a state of the country, which 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 is a state of the country, Bangladesh is a state of the country. Dr. Khalid Kojar, the first time Davos is a World Economic Forum, he was talking about Davos. He said that when Bangladesh was talking about Davos in the World Economic Forum, he said that Bangladesh was talking about the first time. The first thing is that the first thing is climate change, and the first thing is that 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 Global Community Engagement and Degenerance Fund has been created. 
প্রাথমিক পর্যায়ে কয়েকটি দেশে পাইলট প্রজেক্ট হিসেবে নিয়েছে তার মধ্যে বাংলাদেশ একটি যে কমিউনিটিকে ইনভলভ করে স্থানীয় সম্প্রদায়কে ইনভলভ করে এই যে জঙ্গিবাদের সৃষ্টি হচ্ছে এই যে সন্ত্রাসবাদের সৃষ্টি হচ্ছে যার সঙ্গে বিশ্ব সন্ত্রাসবাদের কোথাও কোথাও যোগাযোগ আছে সেটি কীভাবে নিরসন করা যায় সে ব্যাপারে তারা একটা ভূমিকা রাখার চেষ্টা করবেন আমরা বিরতির পরে সে বাংলাদেশে তারা কীভাবে কাজ করবেন সেই বিষয়ে শুনব নিশ্চয়ই আপনারা আমাদের সঙ্গে থাকবেন Dr. Khalid, again, welcome to our show. We discussed previously about some theoretical aspect, your dream or uh, your organization's strategy, how you would like to work in Bangladesh. We also some this point, bring some point, how the domestic uh, radicalization linked with the international thing. And you were just uh, nicely pointing out that our Prime Minister's speech in Davos and World Economic Forum that uh, she uh, find two threats, one is the climate change and uh, another is the radicalization. Uh, if i if we took the global perspe perspective how big st this threat are we now knew that syria some afghanistan might be or nigeria but if you would just consider the global context mm -hmm. how big this uh, uh, the terrorism or radicalization threat uh, affect the society domestically it's a very good question and i think we don't have clear statistics on this one way to measure the direct impact of terrorism is to see how many people die in the hands of terrorist causes. And the recent Global Terrorism Index suggests that something like 10,000 people in the world died as a result directly of terrorism. Uh, and of course that means that we have to adopt perspective. We are of course shocked by what happened in Paris recently where 17 people were killed by terrorism, but at the same time 2,000 people were killed in Nigeria. So maintaining some level of, of perspective I think it is important. In terms of direct deaths, I don't think terrorism is having a huge impact. It's not killing large numbers of people, as large a number, for example, as disease or perhaps climate change or conflict. I think what terrorism is doing is making, and of course this is the purpose of terrorism, is making large swathes of the global population nervous and worried and frightened to travel or frightened to go to particular countries or mistrusting. One of my real concerns, and I have a background working in migration, is that there is a knee-jerk short-term reaction to the risk of terrorism. In, in my country, the United Kingdom, for example, you see increasing restrictions on migration because there's somehow a concern that migration might be importing terrorism. You see a growing xenophobia against foreigners. You see a growing movement of anti-Islamic behavior against Muslims. These are all enormously inappropriate responses to what is still quite a, I think, quite a small threat. So I think perception is as important as actuality in this field. Uh, I particularly just uh, side then question uh, when you mentioned about the uh, Paris issue, France issue. Mm. Uh, that's true. Mm, uh, when an uh, extremist group killed several journalists in a newspaper, we should not uh, appreciate this. We just hate this thing. Absolutely. This is the direct threat to a place freedom issues. But on the other hand, there's another criticism that that newspaper or the media does must have a respect to the religion mm -hmm. where millions of people, billions of people believe it. So you should not disrespect their belief. Don't you think there should be a line where the press freedoms and the respect to the other community, there should be a line to draw? Personally, I do. I'm not French and I know that there's a very strong French principle of the freedom of press and it is up to the French government and society to make that decision. But I personally agree with you that um, I think we have the right to expect the press to be sensitive and respectful. And clearly publishing offensive cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad is not a particularly respectful thing to do. And I agree with you that it, uh, it's quite offensive as, a, as someone with a Muslim background. But equally, let's be very clear, you don't kill people for drawing stop. cartoons. Okay. Full stop. Okay. So the, yes, it's offensive. Yes, the press should I think be more respective, but you do not kill people for, for writing books or drawing cartoons. Anyway, now, uh, now we again come to Bangladesh. Uh, when do you start your project here, the pilot project? Uh, when you designed to start it? Thank you. I was, I was here this week to try to set up the process. Mm -hmm. I'll be here, I believe, again in about a month to take the process forward. 
And then we are reassuring the Bangladeshi government and indeed our governing board back in, back in Geneva that by September this year we will be providing grants to communities in Bangladesh and other countries. How, how these things will start? The ball will be rolled. Can you just uh, visualize the thing? I can. Of course, it's a complex architecture, but, but put very simply, we are establishing a national stakeholder group that includes the government, that I think will be chaired by the government, but also has private sector, civil society mm. representatives. We will rely on that group to put out a call for proposals as widely as possible, to appeal to communities to propose to us projects that they think will make a difference. The national group will then make a judgment on those proposals. Mm -hmm. Those judgments will then be looked at by an independent review panel, mm -hmm. and then the board will make final decisions. So we have, a, I think, a robust but streamlined process to select projects that we think will have an impact and then to provide money for those projects. We're trying to do this swiftly. I mean, the initial uh, part will be the project with the research, the find out the root cause, and then we'll to go to the visualized uh, or the specific project. Absolutely. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, how long this project will continue for Bangladesh? Is there any time frame? Uh, no, I mean, as long as the Bangladeshi government is willing to engage with GSURF, I imagine it will be increasing the number of countries we work with over the next couple of years. But I certainly hope that Bangladesh continues to work with us for many years to come. I think that there is a, a challenge in Bangladesh. I think that the sort of work we're doing can help resolve that challenge. I think the government is very committed. Um, I think by providing small grants in a sustainable manner to projects, mm -hmm. we can make a real difference. So I certainly hope this is a long-term relationship. But I think, I think you already mentioned some points, very, uh, very specific and interesting thing. One is uh, to make a tolerant society. It's, it's a very, very easy term to explain thing. But uh, when uh, some group of the society uh, jump over to this uh, dark part of mm -hmm. the uh, activity because of the poverty, that could be another way to address. But when it comes to the question of the uh, rich people, uh, son, those who started the private uh, uh, universities, the huge amount of money, I think that would be, need to be more, more research, the why this thing happened and who practically changed their mindsets. I agree with you and, and this is not a fund that is supposed to be focusing on religion specifically, or indeed on poor people specifically. We are looking to the country mechanism, to the country stakeholder group, to advise us where they think the greatest risks are. We would look to, to, to the mechanism we're establishing here in Bangladesh to say to us that there are particular communities, or particular regions of the country, or particular sectors of society that we think are at risk. And that's where we think we should be spending our money. Now the university students, you're right, are a very interesting example. They are not poor, they're generally not disenfranchised, they're not marginalised, and yet some of them are becoming extremist. And I think the internet has a lot to play in that particular uh, part of the, the puzzle. Now one of the sorts of projects I can imagine us funding is to use the internet to counter the narratives that are out there. We know that some of these terrorist groups, you mentioned ISIS, are very effective on the internet. They have very strong messages that appeal to some people. I think there's a space to put out counter narratives, to share with young people who may be looking at the computers and thinking that it might be a heroic thing to do to go to Syria, mm. to share them the realities, that going to Syria is dangerous, that you won't be a hero, that you'll be asked to do difficult and dangerous things, that you may end up committing terrible crimes like beheading people, that this is not a sensible thing to do. Let us use the internet and social media and Twitter to try to make a difference, to try to convey to people who perhaps aren't thinking sensibly. Another big aspect here, I think, is the role of critical thinking. And I, I can certainly imagine that some of the work we will fund is around critical thinking, making people question. I've heard this, it seems reasonable, but I just want to think about it. Perhaps I'll discuss it with my parents, or perhaps I'll discuss it with my friends. There may be another way. There isn't a single truth. Making people think and engage and debate and be a bit more critical may be one way to help, especially university students, perhaps make better decisions. In Bangladesh, we have another experience, perhaps you already knew, that we have uh, around 54,000 or maybe 60,000 non-registered Islamic schools. They don't want to be controlled by anybody. Mm -hmm. They think that these schools are a community school. They're supported by the community. And their only job is to uh, teach the common uh, phenomenon of the religion. 
and nothing linked with the modern uh, science, mm -hmm. technology, and other things. And uh, mm -hmm. some of them, uh, some of these uh, is, uh, Islamic schools are supported by the foreign donation. Even they don't want to come to any discipline. They don't want to come to any uh, curriculum or the syllabus. So this is a big problem mm -hmm. because a young boy who does not have any ability to go to the school, but uh, the uh, non-registered Islamic schools provide them everything and they trained up with their own style and when they try to, we try to include them in the general society as a whole, they sometimes did not match with them. They thought that it is not our society, my society is completely different. Yeah. So do, don't you think that this will be a huge challenge when you just start your project that try to bring or convince these, uh, uh, these Islamic schools to come to the uh, general uh, education level? Absolutely. No, I don't think it's necessarily my or our job to, to do that. I mean, I think I'd, I'd make two reflections on what you've said. Firstly, often radicalization and extremism occurs because radical groups fill a gap in governance. And we've seen this especially in the Middle East. Radical groups can provide education, can provide health care, can provide social welfare, can fill a gap in governance. And that, of course, appeals to people. Uh, and that's about poor governance or bad governance or corrupt governance, I think, in Bangladesh, poor governance, as in not enough money, uh, rather than any of, of the other two. So certainly where there's a gap in governance, uh, radical groups can move in and I think can appeal uh, to young people. Now, the 54,000 unregistered schools you speak about, this is a political issue, and, and, and this fund is trying as far as possible not to be political. Uh, and of course, you, you've pointed out some of the... Uh, there's the unregistered schools, there's the ongoing tensions in, in the region. These are larger political and governmental issues that we can't possibly become involved in. What we can do is work with communities that will let us work with them to try to make a difference. And I think it, it's sort of, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't want to leave this interview conveying the impression that this fund is the solution to Bangladesh's problems. But I would say that Bangladesh's problems cannot be solved without this fund. This is one part of a whole series of, of, of things that are needed. Uh, that's okay. We appreciate your presence there, but I don't want to make nervous you because I just bring <laughs> some practical questions there, which practically concern to uh, us also, or those who are practically in thinking your line, yeah. we, even without having any foreign fund or any uh, uh, fund like your organization, we want that our society must be a uh, radical uh, force free or the terrorism free. We have another problem. On one hand, the government, or by support uh, from your organization, will provide some financial support to engage the community to develop a comparatively moderate society, comparatively uh, sensible society, and try to avoid all sorts of uh, uh, terrorism and criminalization. But on the other hand, if we take the case of Bangladesh mm -hmm. uh, specific. On the other hand, we have our experience, there are lots of financial institutions mm -hmm. in the name of even the different uh, religion, uh, religious group. They provide money in the opponent side. Yes. So that will be a huge challenge. And uh, I, am I don't know how uh, your good wishes or the pious wishes will come true if this sort of funding from different sources to uh, uprise or make the deep-rooted organization here, how you will manage this thing? I share your concern. I mean, I'm perhaps more optimistic than you. These aren't just my pious or, or hopeful concerns. Uh, I mean, this fund is, is, has very significant backing from the international community. I think the international community sees this as, again, part of the answer. But I think you're quite right, and I think we should be honest. I think it's probably easier to make someone a radical than to bring them back from radicalization. Reversing the process is a very difficult thing to do. What we can do is to try to identify communities at risk, to try to speak to those communities, find out what they think the answers are, and try to support them in those answers. Again, I'm, I'm not pretending that this fund alone can be the answer, but I think it's a central part of finding an answer. A few years back uh, when there is a uh, counter-terrorism activities going on between India and Pakistan mm -hmm. and some parts of uh, Bangladesh also uh, uh, branded as the habit for another country's terrorist activity. There's sort of discussions going on. At that point, our Prime Minister made a proposal and she said that if we have a regional task force to fight the terrorism, that could be a help 
to fight the regional terrorism. Mm -hmm. How do you think that is proposed? Again, I'm not an expert in this part of the world, but on the face of it, that sounds like a very sensible proposal. I mean, I think Bangladesh is an example of a country where extremism and radicalization have cross-border influences. I don't think we can deny that. And it seems to me that if you have a cross-border challenge, you have to have cross-border solutions. So cooperation with your neighbors, working together to try to find a solution, I think is important. The point is it can't just be a military solution. It has to be also a root causes, development, prevention solution as well. But I, again, without being an expert in the region, intuitively think that a cross-border regional approach would make sense, yes. Uh, this is my last question. Uh, as you are landed Bangladesh, and I, we wish you great success, and we want to be the partner as media Thank you. Uh, to this activity. Uh, just before the conclude the session, if you can just make any statement to the society of Bangladesh, to the civil society of Bangladesh, the common people of Bangladesh, that uh, radicalization is not the right way for development. The extremism, extremism is not the right way to uh, help a country to grow up. Mm -hmm. If you just make an, uh, a call to the society, that will be helped. <laughs> of course, and firstly, thank you for your offer of assistance, and we certainly will need media assistance going forward, so we'll certainly be back to call on you. Um, I'm not an expert on Bangladesh, and I've only been here a few days. But what is clear to me, even in my few days in Bangladesh, is that this is a country that has made enormous progress in terms of development, that has enormous potential, and it would be a tragedy for that potential. It would betray your history. It would betray independence for that legacy, for that potential to be ruined by radicalization. I think Bangladesh isn't yet an extreme society. I think there's a risk that it may become an extreme society. And I think this is the right time for the government, for the opposition, for civil society, for the private sector to really rally around and try to make a difference. I think this is a, a small challenge that can be dealt with. And if it's not dealt with, I fear that it will derail the progress that Bangladesh has made. প্রিয় দর্শক আমরা সাক্ষাৎকারের শেষ পর্যায়ে এই পর্যায়ে আমরা যে বিষয়গুলি নিয়ে কথা বললাম তাকে প্রশ্ন করেছিলাম যে বাংলাদেশের মতো একটি বিভক্ত সমাজে যেখানে সন্ত্রাসবাদের জন্য বিভিন্ন সূত্রের আর্থিক যোগাযোগ আছে আর্থিক সংশ্লেষ আছে সেখানে আপনাদের মতো সংগঠনের সহায়তায় সরকার কিভাবে এটা দমন করবে তিনি চমৎকার একটা উদাহরণ দিয়ে বলেছেন যে দেখেন এখানে শুধুমাত্র সরকার না সিভিল সোসাইটি বিশেষ করে বেসরকারি খাত যারা ব্যবসা বাণিজ্য করে দেশকে অগ্রগতির পথে নিয়ে যেতে চায় তারা কিন্তু এই ব্যাপারে আগ্রহী তারা মনে করে যদি একটি স্থানীয়ভাবে অস্থিতিশীল অবস্থা থাকে তাহলে ব্যবসা বাণিজ্যও ঠিক থাকে না দেশের অগ্রগতিও ঠিকভাবে অর্জন করা যায় না কারণ যে তারা এই জায়গাটিতে আসতে চায় ডক্টর কৌশলের শেষের যে কথাটি বললেন যে বাংলাদেশ একটি অতিমাত্রায় উগ্র দেশ নয় বাংলাদেশ মধ্যম মাত্রায় সহনশীল একটা দেশ এটি সঠিক সময় এই দেশের মানুষকে এই দেশের সরকারকে এই দেশের রাজনীতিকে এই কথা বুঝতে হবে উগ্রবাদ বা উগ্রপন্থা বাংলাদেশের জন্য কোনো সমাধান নয় সেই জন্য তাদের সবাইকে এগিয়ে আসতে হবে বাংলাদেশের স্বাধীনতার যে ঐতিহ্য মুক্তিযুদ্ধের যে ঐতিহ্য সেই ঐতিহ্যের চেতনায় বাংলাদেশকে কখনোই উগ্রপন্থার কাছে ছেড়ে দেওয়া যাবে না বাংলাদেশকে একটা অর্থনৈতিকভাবে সমৃদ্ধিশীল বাংলাদেশ গড়ে তুলতে হলে তাকে সহনশীলতার একটি দেশ পরিণত করতে হবে এবং সেই ক্ষেত্রেই তারা সহায়তা করতে চান ডক্টর খালিদ কৌজার থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ ফর গিভ আস টাইম ইন দ্য শর্ট পিরিয়ড অফ নোটিস and hope to see you in future in our program when you come frequently and we'll start your project with the government i'm sure the civil society the count people of bangladesh will wait for getting the good result from your project thank you sir and thank you for the invitation and i look forward to working with you as you take this forward thank, thank you, you.